Good evening. Welcome to another edition of the Bakey CV Live Innovation on the Loose, streaming live from Houston Methodist Hospital here in the Texas Medical Center. I'm Dr. Stuart Carr, Director of Innovation and Engineering for the Bakey Heart and Vascular Center. Now, tonight I'm absolutely delighted to have on the show Dr. Axel Krieger, Assistant Professor of Mechanical Engineering in the Wyland School of Engineering at Johns Hopkins University. He is here tonight all the way from sunny Baltimore to give insight into the world of smart and autonomous surgery. Now, before we proceed, I'd like to invite the audience into our discussions. So please submit your questions via web at polyv.com using the Bakey as the username or text the Bakey to 37607 alongside your question. You can also add your question into the live YouTube stream. Okay, so let's get the show kicked off. Axel, absolute pleasure having you here. Thank you, Stuart, for uh, inviting me and for the kind introduction. I'm absolutely thrilled uh, to be here today and present our research on smart and autonomous robotic surgery. Um, hopefully we get closer to the answer if future uh, robots will need caffeine or 120 volts. <laughs> So my presentation uh, will talk about uh, our recent uh, paper published in Science Robotics, uh, where we successfully demonstrated autonomous robotic laparoscopic surgery for intestinal anastomosis. And that's a collaboration between Johns Hopkins and Children's National. So why are we interested in smart autonomous uh, surgery? Um, surgery is, of course, a big market. Over 230 million uh, surgical procedures are performed per year worldwide. Um, surgeries and interventions heavily depend on uh, the uh, experience, skill, uh, mental and physical state of the operating surgeon. Um, so if you look at uh, current teleoperated robotic surgery, uh, this is completely teleoperated and depends on the operating surgeon to control every motion of the robot. Um, and uh, most surgeries are also performed without the direct link to preoperative images. And in research, even autonomous functions are very much, lim very much limited to rigid bony anatomy and small subtasks. So our vision of a smart surgery then consists of augmenting critical portions of the manual surgery with robotic precision with increasing levels of autonomy. So surgeons could then take more of a supervisory role uh, for some technically difficult portions of the surgery, uh, for example, suturing and then uh, also providing surgeons with the highest quality diagnostic images during surgery and uh, creating more realistic uh, plans of, and information. So the potential benefits uh, for patients would be to have reduced variability, um, reduced complication rates, accelerate the learning curve, and, and lastly enable new uh, surgeries and procedures. So the fundamental challenge in soft tissue surgery, for example, heart, liver, bowel, kidney, or prostate surgery, are tissue deformations and very unpredictable uh, shape changes. So what you see here on the left is an MRI image of a patient of the small bowel. And on the right is one of our uh, recent pig studies uh, and uh, you know, the bowel prepared for anastomosis. So it looks completely different after you start cutting, suturing, it deforms uh, you know, uh, uh, tremendously. So it's impossible to use preoperative plans from preoperative imaging. And that's very different than hard, uh, rigid surgery like bony anatomy, where you can really rely on preoperative plans, which makes automation so much uh, easy, uh, easier. So that's really the big difficulty in soft tissue surgery, that you cannot pre-plan the surgery well. Of course, we can then rely more on intraoperative imaging, such as color video, uh, to direct our surgical robots, but remains quite a difficult challenge uh, to robustly and accurately differentiate and track target tissue from the background in such an unstructured, deformable surgical environment. So what you see here on the right is an example of uh, urethra to bladder reconstruction. So, you know, to untrained eyes, this is really just a sea of pink. Somewhere there's the urethra, somewhere there's the bladder neck. Really hard to fi find the different anato anatomical structures in this difficult changing environment. So let me start uh, introducing a uh, specific research topic, which is autonomous robotic anastomosis. 
Um, so anastomosis is a critical part of all reconstructive surgery uh, and involves uh, the reconnection of a luminal structure. So over a million um, gastrointestinal, urological, and gynecological anastomosis are performed every year in the U.S. alone. Uh, what you see on the right is a colon anastomosis uh, using sutures. So start by um, approximating the two halves of the bowel, linearizing the sutures, uh, and then suturing the back wall, flipping it over, and then suturing the front wall. So that takes uh, about 20 sutures uh, to uh, close a bowel. Uh, requires a lot of dexterity, precision, and repeatability. So if you want to make one more small mistake in these 20 sutures, then you're going to have a leak and a very bad complication for the patients. You can see that the complication rates are quite high, up to 19% for colorectal anastomosis. That's really something where robots excel in the repeatability uh, and, uh, you know, they don't uh, get tired like a human a surgeon would. So let's let, take a look at uh, the suturing technique. This is a video of an interrupted uh, stitching. Um, you uh, exchange a circular suture needle between two needle drivers. Uh, and now imagine trying to automate that. It's very difficult, right? You have to find uh, this needle in the surgical scene, pick it up precisely, pull it through the tissue in this uh, you know, circular manner. So that's very, very hard to do. So in our lab, we're not just trying to replicate exactly what surgeons do, <laughs> you know, like using the exact same surgical tools and robots, but we actually try to innovate uh, the robotic systems to make it easier to simplify the procedures and uh, make it optimized for the robots, not for the human surgeons. So what are the research areas in innovations that are necessary to, to achieve uh, such more autonomous uh, robotic surgeries? So our research focuses uh, first on novel robotic tools and robotic system developments uh, to minimize the deformations and simplify the procedures. On the right, you see our smart autonomous uh, robot, the STAR system, which consists of uh, two uh, manipulator arms, lightweight uh, seven degree freedom uh, robot arms. Uh, one is equipped with a custom robotic suturing tool. The other one with a custom um, hybrid 3D near-infrared imaging system uh, and that's all uh, placed on a surgical table. Um, we are also working on improving surgical imaging and planning uh, with a focus on 3D tissue tracking and uh, to precisely guide our uh, robot to targets. And lastly, we work on robot control uh, strategies including shared, supervised and uh, autonomous robot control with increasing level of autonomy. So we identified a commercial available suturing tool that we use for our robot. It's called the Endo360. Um, and the tool integrates uh, that circular suture motion already inside the tool tip. So that greatly simplifies the path planning. So we don't need to program uh, the needle path, just the desired suture location. Um, for manual surgery, it's really not uh, you know, so easy to use because this tool is quite heavy, a little cumbersome with a lot of knobs to use, but for our robot, uh, you know, it's really ideal, can easily hold the heavier tool, no problem. Um, that also allows us to perform the suturing with a single arm and uh, provides an additional degree of freedom. So we motorized uh, the circular needle motion and then also the pitch joint added a torque uh, force sensor to measure and control the suture tension. So to, to direct our robotic suturing tool to tissue targets, uh, we require quantitative 3D imaging. So we need to find the 3D co uh, coordinate of a target uh, in, uh, on the tissue. So commercial 3D cameras are typically quite large and uh, are really only suited for open surgery where you have a full incision and opening the, the, um, the, the organs. Uh, for laparoscopic surgery, where you go in with just a keyhole access, um, we teamed up with Professor Chin Kang uh, and his students uh, at Hopkins and uh, developed this structured light camera using a digital light projector. So the structural uh, light projections are uh, projecting fringe patterns onto the surgical scene with different um, uh, uh, frequencies. 
and uh, the resulting reflection is then analyzed and converted into a 3D point cloud of the surgical scene. We can then use that to find um, you know, the area that we want to suture and plan uh, you know, suture locations with even spacing to have a very consistent suture line. So uh, the 3D laparoscope provides a 3D point cloud of the scene, but it's still hard to distinguish uh, target tissue from the background and then react to deformations in motion. Um, the surgical scene is very homogeneous and it's very hard uh, to see uh, you know, um, what's going on. So we have developed uh, these uh, special biocompatible markers that glow when excited by NIR light. They are uh, made out of ICG, endokinin green, very commonly uh, an FDA approved um, fluorescent dye with a surgical glue called permabond. So this is a liquid that we can stick onto the corners of the tissue and it uh, is super bright and provides us a really robust landmark of the corner of the target that we want to operate on. And so we can you know, react to motions easily, we can detect deformations um, and uh, you know, adjust our suture plans uh, on the fly uh, during uh, the procedure. Uh, using such surgical landmarks is a bit cumbersome and also difficult to translate to clinical use because they might uh, remain in the body, you know. Um, so we're also working on markerless tracking using uh, machine learning techniques. Um, so our prototype algorithm uh, is, uh, consists of uh, cascaded uh, units uh, providing then a heat map of the corners of the tissue that we are aiming to suture. So we tested this algorithm on uh, 25 images and achieved uh, landmark detections within a couple pixels. So really uh, good preliminary data that shows that we, you know, in the future can uh, hopefully eliminate the use of, uh, you know, surgical landmarks, um, uh, artificial surgical landmarks that we can just, you know, detect the anatomy uh, directly using machine learning. So that's the diagram of our control system for the STAR robot. Uh, the vision system consists of the NIR view, uh, the infrared uh, view, and then the 3D point cloud. So we analyze uh, the, um, uh, the NIR view to um, uh, analyze, uh, to detect the breathing motion and motion of the, pa uh, of the patient. Um, that triggers then the acquisition of the 3D point cloud and also synchronizes the motion of the robot uh, with the breathing cycle. Um, so after we have the 3D point cloud, uh, we uh, create a high-level suture logic that plans the suture points uh, with even spacing on the surface of the tissue. Um, then we plan uh, the smooth trajectory, so the approach of the surgical tool, uh, the uh, entire uh, trajectory convert that uh, to joint space and send it to the robot. And if the system detects a shift or motion of the tissue during the procedure, the plan is then automatically updated. A bit more detail on the breathing and uh, motion tracker. We use a convolutional neural network to determine if the tissue is in motion or stopped. Um, we utilize the position history of the markers. Uh, observing the bright uh, NIR dots. So we calculate the difference between the current image frame and uh, the one two seconds ago to indicate uh, the direction of the motion. Uh, we used label data on prior experiments uh, to train the algorithm and get uh, an accuracy of detecting the breathing motion in, uh, in the high 90%. So here's a little video of the STAR robot then in action. We have the robotic suturing tool on uh, the 7 degree freedom uh, robot arm with the force sensor with the different degrees of freedom. Uh, this is manually inserted uh, through a keyhole into the um, abdomen and uh, then uh, the camera detects the corners of the tissue, acquires the point cloud and then directs uh, the robot to pour, perform the suture start with the back wall and then flip the tissue and suture the front wall uh, to create a leak-free anastomosis in the end. Here you see the robotic surgical tool in action performing uh, uh, suturing uh, first the back wall and now after flipping over the front wall to get the full closure of the tissue. 
Uh, you can also s uh, see the synchronization with the breathing. So, um, you know, we detect, detect the breathing and then, uh, you know, trigger both the three point cloud and the robot motion together. After that, we just take out uh, the robot and um, look uh, at the final anastomosis if it's, it's leak free. So we wanted to compare our robotic system against expert surgeons performing the same procedures. So we had a study, uh, organized a study on uh, phantom tissue with uh, three groups. We had our star robot uh, compared to manual laparoscopic uh, expert surgeons. We call that group LAP. And then using the current uh, teleoperated um, state-of-the-art robotic system, the Da Vinci SI. Um, and so that was the RAS group. So three groups um, and we uh, did you know, five uh, suture samples each. Uh, the comparison criteria was uh, number one, we looked at uh, the number of suture hesitancy events. That happens when uh, a surgeon would place a needle, don't like the final position and pull it back out. For our robot, it was you know, going to the wrong spot and not hitting the tissue uh, correctly. Um, we also looked at the completion time and then the consistency of both the suture spacing and bite depths. You can imagine if you have very consistent uh, you know, spacing between each suture, it's really ideal for leak-free anastomosis. If you have sometimes very uh, small spacing, sometimes large spacing, then of course you know, the liquid will find the weakest point and, and uh, you know, leak at that point of the large gap. So that's the table showing the results of our recent uh, study. Um, we uh, showed that we were significantly um, uh, better in the suture hesitancy events. So they happened uh, nearly 100% uh, for every stitch uh, that you know, a needle was misplaced for the manual surgery um, and about uh, you know, 30% for uh, using the Da Vinci robot and only about 11% uh, for the star robot. Um, so, you know, a lot um, uh, uh, statistically significantly better performance there. Um, and the other uh, component is that uh, in panel D and uh, panel F, we showed that we were also consistently better in the uh, consistency of the suture spacing and the bite size. If you look at uh, panel B, you can see that the time of the, uh, you know, completion time of the surgery, um, that the star robot was a little bit slower uh, than our competitors uh, and our comparison groups. And um, this is, we ran our robot <coughs> at a pretty sl uh, slow speed. So we wanted to make sure that <coughs> there are no um, unforeseen issues and that the surgeon can always I intervene in time. Uh, so um, this is definitely something we can improve in the future and get our robot uh, to run faster. But in this study, we were slightly slower than the manual surgery. Um, we took a representative uh, example and uh, placed it in the MRI scanner to look at flow, uh, flow, flow profiles under 40 um, flow imaging. Um, the star robot performed a very consistent uh, suture line and that resulted in much more laminar flow than compared to the uh, manual surgery uh, example and the Da Vinci surgical example. So nice evidence that maybe the flow uh, through the full anastomosis is better. So we didn't just stop at the uh, ex vivo comparison. We also performed an uh, in vivo study with four animals at uh, Children's National. Um, you can see on the right on the picture um, the pattern for the incisions of the ports. So we had uh, two ports uh, for the tool and camera and then extra ports uh, for setting up manually the suture and then also putting extra cameras in to observe the, um, the surgery um, and uh, film it uh, for evaluation. A couple of videos of the star robot performing the in vivo uh, uh, surgery of both the back wall and then uh, the front wall. You can see those little NIR markers at the corner of the tissue and then um, you know uh, the robot going in synchronizing the motion uh, with the breathing detecting automatically the end of the breathing cycle then advancing the tool and then also taking the 3D point cloud image. 
the table shows our results of uh, that recent uh, survival study. Um, we, all four animals, uh, did really well after surgery, um, had did no, uh, not show any complications. Our leak pressure got significantly higher between the second and the third animal, but there was never any uh, you know, uh, worry that there was a potential leak. Um, so um, this work uh, really demonstrates that uh, laparoscopic uh, soft tissue surgery with high degree of autonomy is uh, feasible. Yeah, the, uh, in summary, uh, what we've shown is that uh, autonomous robotic systems have the potential to perform such complex surgical tasks, uh, in this case anastomosis, and even uh, experience higher accuracy and precision compared to uh, minimally invasive surgery and robotic assisted surgery. Um, our next big step is to push uh, for first in human studies, uh, which will require uh, development of a miniaturized uh, endoscope, uh, replacing the current NRI tracking with markerless uh, AI-based uh, tissue tracking, um, and lastly, improving the fail-safe operation of STAR. Currently, it's really geared towards um, engineers uh, you know, running the system and not uh, really well uh, set up for surgeons to intervene if something um, uh, would go wrong. I'm really excited uh, about this uh, development and also think that our entire field uh, you know, is more accepting of this idea of autonomous robotic surgery. Uh, just last week I was at a conference at AUA uh, in uh, New Orleans where we had an entire day with surgeons about you know, autonomous robotic surgery. And uh, I was really uh, excited to hear that how accepting surgeons are uh, with uh, this new technology and I really hope it's um, benefiting our patients. So um, with that, I wanted to thank the funding source, uh, the great team at Hopkins at uh, Children's uh, and open up for any questions and discussion. Thank you. Well, thank you, Axel. That was superb there. If you go back your slide to the to thank you, I just want to note, I mean, that was a big team you had there. I mean, it was, it was like 30, 40 people. <laughs> um, so truly collaborative environment there. Um, you know, before we take some questions from the audience, I'd love to know a little bit more about your process. So from concept to submission, I guess, this paper, like, how did you think about the idea? What was the first thing that happened? How did you get the funding, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, this uh, has been definitely a, 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 a you know, long process. We started on autonomous uh, robotic uh, surgery uh, around 2011, so quite wow. a long time. Um, and yeah, really started with you know, the clinical idea of you know, doing a different uh, paradigm of robotic surgery mm -hmm. and with more autonomy and, and, and uh, intelligence. And you know, started um, you know, on the technical side with very simplified you know, phantom work, just linear sutures placed with just pre-programming the robot doing mm -hmm. something. And then over time got more and more complex. You know? Started also using open surgery where we could use huge cameras. So we published our first uh, you know, big study Science Translational Medicine in 2016 in using open surgery. Mm -hmm. And now we, we, can sh uh, we showed that we can do such a complex procedure laparoscopically and you know, in, a, in a breathing you know, uh, uh, preclinical study. So you know, long, long work, <laughs> yeah. large team, and, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, and then you know, also funding steps during the way. Uh, during the way. Okay. <laughs> That's superb. I mean, I'm curious as well, like, do you see autonomous robotic surgery being applied more for, like, I want to say easier surgeries, but by that I mean more like repetitive surgeries, or do you think it's got more of a place in very complex, accurate and precise surgeries? Um, a f fantastic question. I, um, I th think uh, if it's a very, um, st you know, a, a relatively easy surgery, there might not be really a need because the complication rate is already, it's really low. Okay. So I think that the, the value would really be in a surgery that is, has a high complication rate where a particular step requires a lot of precision and repeatability, such as suturing, you know, that's why it's such a good uh, example for that. It's a very critical surgical step that requires such high, uh, you know, degree of repeatability and precision. Um, you know, other surgical steps I could see could benefit from would be, you know, the 
um, tumor resection with a very mm -hmm. precise margin if you mm -hmm. want to like if you you have a capability of visualizing the tumor and want to program the robot to you know excise it with exactly you know a couple millimeters of margin to you know uh, maintain uh, as much of the healthy tissue as possible uh, that would be also something where i think the, ro uh, the robot could really outperform uh, surgeons so like tumor cases where like Say for example, pancreatic cancer where it's involved and enveloped over the superior mesenteric artery and it's, it's right there and you've got to get really shave off air. Okay. Yeah, that would be a, a, a great example to, uh, to work on. And so, I mean, I, you know, in regard to your imaging, um, you were saying you were using a, a biomarker that you had kind of immersed in like a glue and you would dab it on. And um, Are you making any improvements in regard to the imaging aspect of that? Like, is there room for improvement? with different types of biomarkers or application of those markers, et cetera? Um, yeah, there's huge uh, improvements, you know. I think um, our surgical imaging is getting so good um, that we, you know, we think we don't need to rely on these uh, biomarkers, on these uh, landmarks anymore for surgeries. Mm -hmm. So we can use, and I showed some preliminary work uh, in this uh, presentation already, we can use machine learning techniques to consistently find, you know, uh, surgical landmarks on uh, the uh, actual you know uh, color image you know so the definition is so good uh, and you know we can we can find those for example corners of the anastomosis consistently already okay um you know taking some questions from our audience here so you know talking about improvements so so yeah i mean obviously you've got a very complex integrated system there so w what's the biggest thing that you think needs to be improved in order to get it in the clinic or, or even not for the clinic for another application maybe um i, I yeah i really uh, believe that we need to uh, uh have a better interface uh, for surgeons to interact with our robot it's okay. so been really you know was clinical need driven uh, but the development is now very much centered for engineers using the system, you know, sitting on a keyboard, programming, you know, <laughs> adjusting. <laughs> and, you know, this is really not, uh, not uh, you know, uh, practical to use uh, clinically. So, you know, uh, involving the uh, surgeons more in a way that they uh, know how to interact with robots, like, for example, sitting on a controller such as in Da Vinci. Mm -hmm. And then if, you know, the robot, uh, you know, makes a, a small mistake, doesn't get to a, an area for a, a suture to allow the surgeon to kind of seamlessly intervene and, you know, adjust the position um, and then go back to the autonomous mode. You know, like going back in and out between autonomous and teleoperated mode, making this seamless uh, and, you know, always that, you know, the robot, uh, you know, has the confidence to, to go in and, 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 and the trust of the surgeon to get to the right thing. Those are things that, you know, uh, really need to be worked out. So, so like, you're talking about the interface between the surgeon and the robot. I mean, I guess that could be something maybe you could do with a HoloLens, right? Or like a VR system even. Yeah, like, uh, okay. that could, could, could also be uh, uh, used, you know, uh, and in cases where, uh, you know, the robot you know misplaces a tool you know slightly it's not at the correct uh, spot you, you need to allow the surgeon to you know seamlessly make some small adjustments and get to the right spot got it um question from the audience asking about other applications uh, so maybe you know yeah what other clinical applications or surgical applications are there maybe also comment about your micro vascular applications? Uh, yeah, um, you know, we've been working on intestinal anastomosis, you know, uh, imagine we could do something like that in microvessel anastomosis okay. that is so technically difficult, that would be a, 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 a enormous. Um, also really excited about applications where we don't have surgeons uh, present. So imagine, <laughs> you know, uh, you had a robot uh, in an emergency vehicle, you know, could yeah. do some life-saving cares on the way to the hospital. So, you know, performing, uh, you know, detecting an internal hemorrhage and, and stopping that internal hemorrhage on the way to the hospital so you can survive a, a, a devastating accident or um, that, that would be tremendous. Like a mechanical thrown back to me, you know, like clot removal, <laughs> like stroke. I mean, that would be very impressive. Um, so, yeah, and, and when, when do you think we're going to start seeing this in the clinic? So not only your system, but, you know, closed-loop autonomous robotic systems in general. 
Yeah, I, I see this, uh, you know, not uh, that we're going to be fully teleoperated and then one day it's going to be like fully autonomous, you know, there's going to be a scale and it's going to be, you know, a, a bit like autonomous driving, right, you know, where you're going to see some autonomous functions like park assist, brake assist, you know, yeah. similar to, to that, we're going to have, you know, some autonomous function built in slowly and, you know, Im and if they you know, really improve the surgical performance and get accepted well, then you can see more and more of it, you know. Um, we have uh, about a five-year, you know, plan for getting uh, to first in human studies. Oh. Depends a bit on funding, uh, but we think we can do the, you know, preclinical tests that are necessary to, you know, do a first in uh, human study in, in ab about five years. And, yeah, you know, one of the last questions for myself, I guess, is, you know, we saw a robotic kind of hand system there. Um, in the video, so are they off the shelf robotic systems or did you have to team up with a robotics industrial company to get access to that? Yeah, the robotic uh, manipulators that you saw in the videos are uh, KUKA robots, uh, the German uh, robot company KUKA. Uh, those are you know, commercially available systems. Um, and so we, we, we use those and interface with them and then build you know, a custom uh, software architecture on top of it. Got it. Well, I, I think that on that note, I think we'll end. Uh, that was a really interesting talk there. Um, again, I think it's, it's going to be really amazing as to where all this robotic autonomous systems are, are going. I mean, the FDA is obviously interested in it. You know, it's happening. So I guess it's, it's kind of watch this space, see where we are in five to ten years. Um, maybe surgeons might be out of jobs at some point, <laughs> you know? No, we really want to help, yeah. help surgeons yeah, uh, yeah. do a better procedure and not, um, not, not at all replace. <laughs> there you go. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, ladies and gentlemen, you know, people in the audience, you know, thank you very much for patching in. This is actually the last episode, I believe, of season two of Innovation on the Loose. So, you know, a great way to end it on a real high note. Uh, we are back with season three in September of this year. So, you know, let's tune in and we'll give you information ahead. Uh, I'd also like to bring your attention one more thing that we're launching tomorrow, and that's a Pumps and Pipes um, initiative. So we are launching a new series called In the Mind. And it's a, a mini-series taking a in behind, you know, behind the scenes, a fly in the wall look at some of the innovators and technologists and people in the Pumps and Pipes ecosystem here in the Texas Medical Center in Houston. So tomorrow, on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, 6 p.m. Please tune in for our live premiere. It'll be 17 minutes long, and it's in the mind of Dr. Alan Lumsden, who is the founder of Pumps and Pipes. And on that note, again, I'd just like to thank the audience, but more importantly, I'd like to thank you again, Axel, for coming all the way down from Baltimore. You know, we had a lovely day <laughs> together. Um, you know, had a tour of Mighty, met a lot of people, and, and thank you very much for coming down. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It was fantastic. Right. Thank you. Okay, on that note, we'll leave you a little teaser trailer of In The Mind, Dr. Alan Lumsden. Thank you very much, goodbye. He had an interview because I wanted to meet Dr. DeBakey. I really had no intention of actually taking the job and, and leaving. I love working at Methodist. Methodist is easily the best healthcare organization that I've ever worked in. Number one, they take great care of the patients. Number two, they take great care of their, their, their staff and the personnel who actually work there. During one of the storms, at the park in Rice Village, which is behind us, and there's a walking down this thing knee deep in water. Routine, the key to life. Because the engineers are the ones who actually solve problems. We can identify the problems, but in my world, uh, cardiovascular world, they're the ones who actually help solve the problem. And I remember one day, uh, Dr. Bakey called me up and he would say, you know, say, what are you doing, Alan? I'd say, the answer was always nothing, sir. What can I do for you? He said, can you come up here? But you know what? It's a big operation. There's lots of complications. If there's a more minimally invasive way of doing this, I think that's what we should be doing in this patient. And I think that was really the measure of the man was that he was, again, always looking, was always looking for the, the next leap into how we can maintain the core part of that operation but diminish the magnitude of the physiologic insult to the patient. One of the more fun things that an academic surgeon gets to do is participate in educational programs. And one of the ones that we're doing today is probably one of the more exciting things. It's an experiment. It's called uh, Mighty XR. We're looking at robotics and virtual reality.